Hello and welcome to VU Sports Wired. I'm Simon Gibbs alongside Justin Hershey and Bobby Kent. We have quite an interesting show for you here in the third episode of fall 2020. Football played South Carolina for the second week in a row. They lost their game 41 to seven. We'll get to that. Soccer played South Carolina for the second time in a row. They lost and this loss was arguably decided by referees in a bit of a controversial matter. But on top of all of this, we've got COVID all across the conference. Most notably, of course, at VU Sports Wire, talking Vanderbilt sports, Vanderbilt has COVID. There is a COVID outbreak that started on Saturday, which we will, or started prior to Saturday and impacted the Commodores this past week. But it has also forced them under the 53 player minimum, which by SEC rules means the game may be postponed. It has been postponed by Commissioner Greg Sankey, and the tentative date is now set for December 12th, which means the Commodores go from COVID bye week to actual bye week to Ole Miss. So Vanderbilt has three weeks until they play their next SEC opponent. In the meantime, though, before Vanderbilt football returns, we'll break down their loss. We may not talk about what's to come because we have no idea what this team is going to look like when they next take the field against an actual opponent. But first, let's start with this past Saturday. We had known, we had worried that something was coming when on Friday night, the day before the game, Donovan Kaufman tested tested positive or tweeted that he tested positive uh, for COVID-19. And while he subsequently deleted the tweet, I went into the game the following day saying, oh boy, what are we looking at here? How many people are going to be out? And I waited and I waited and I waited until maybe 25, 30 minutes before kickoff. A spokesperson for Vanderbilt Athletics said a brutal truth that Vanderbilt would have just 56 scholarship players for this contest. And like I said, 53, under 53, the game could be postponed. Heading into that game, when you heard the 56 player or 56 active scholarship player news, Justin, Bobby, how much did you think this would impact Vanderbilt? And were you concerned going into this game with not just how they'd play shorthanded, but how it might impact South Carolina. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when Kaufman sent out that tweet, Simon, you and I were immediately texting. That's a problem. I mean, to lose Kaufman, who's your second leading tackle and second leading tackler and all those secondary pieces were out again uh, this past weekend. Jerkins didn't play. And that's just a huge problem for this Commodore team that doesn't have incredible depth across the board. I think coming into the year, Mason felt really confident about his team's depth. But when you lose first line starters consistently at multiple positions, that's just going to be a recipe for disaster. And that's not something they could afford uh, against a a South Carolina team that impressed me and played really well, but has been playing really well. But as we'll get into, I really saw more problems with the with the run defense uh, than even the pass defense, even though the secondary was so impacted. But certainly you had to be concerned. And, you know, that's what that's a sign of the times. But it really affected the Commodores this past Saturday. I mean, it's, it's never good. Uh, you can't, I don't think you can ever look at a situation where you're almost, you know, out of enough players to be able to even play a game um, and say it's a good thing. I mean, I agree with you entirely, Justin, that it's, you, if our team that already is not as deep as, say, some other schools in the conference to lose players, um, you know, due to a, a, an extenuating circumstance, so like, like a COVID, you know, virus, um, it's, it's not great. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Yeah, and, you know, heading into this matchup, while I wasn't necessarily thinking Vanderbilt would come out with a victory, I thought this would be one of the only winnable games on their schedule. Um, And what really made me think that, what really solidified that thought process and and, and my theory that, you know, this South Carolina team is far from the talented team that Vanderbilt would be playing week in and week out, I edited Alex Venero's Behind Enemy Bylines with Michael Sauls, the co-sports editor for the Daily Gamecock there, South Carolina student-run newspaper, and Michael seemed thoroughly unimpressed with the Gamecocks so far. So much so that he was basically saying, you know, I sure hope we beat Vandy. I think we will, but I sure hope we do. And that's the sort of thinking that made me believe, you know, this guy's watching the same Vanderbilt football we're watching. And if he's hoping that South Carolina pulls out with a victory, you know, they may not be as talented as we, as we expected or as they have been in years past. And frankly, I 
was not impressed with them seeing them on Saturday. I mean, they, I thought they looked terrible. I thought in the first half, this is an extremely ten nothing, extremely close ten nothing ball game. Which if Vanderbilt had made the twenty nine yard field goal they had missed, if Vanderbilt had punched in the red zone opportunity that they missed, that's a tie ball game going into halftime. And then we're talking about a completely different contest in the second half. But anyways, before we get on to some of the negatives, before we get on to some of the things that Vanderbilt may not have done so well in that game, because in my opinion, there were plenty of them. Did you guys have any positive takeaways from the Commodore's performance on Saturday in a 41 to seven loss to South Carolina? Well, the positive takeaways are few and far between, but I guess one nice thing that I enjoyed seeing out on the field was Keon Brook, Keon Henry Brooks being back. I thought he ran the ball well. I think he showed off some of that speed that um, obviously Javion Marlowe didn't play, but that speed that Jamari Wakefield really doesn't have. It's a gear that um, Brooks showed us last year a lot, especially uh, in that game against Northern Illinois. So he was averaging five and a half yards a carry, 13 touches for him. And I think that's great. I think they needed to keep feeding him that ball. Um, and Ken Seals kind of, again, it, it was a similar Ken Seals performance without some of the um, even worse throws um, this week. It was an efficient, efficient game for not too many yards, um, but he did spread it around a little bit more. Uh, three receivers caught four or more balls, and I think that's a good thing uh, to see out of Seals. But obviously, the defense, I, I couldn't give you one positive from the defensive side of the ball. I mean, I would look at the defensive line, I guess. I mean, they did get a little bit more pressure on um, Colin Little this week um, versus against LSU and Miles Brennan. But um, I think Ken Seals was probably one of the most, the biggest bright spot. Uh, I mean, he didn't turn the ball over, so that's an exciting thing. But he also didn't do enough to have, for the team to have a chance to win and stay in it. Um, and again, I don't know how much of that is just on the defense and then how much of that is also a stagnant offense and play calling, but I think Ken is probably the, the biggest takeaway. And I do agree about Keon Brooks. I think he did um, show us that he deserves to receive the bulk of the carries. Um, and when he did have his opportunities, he was effective at grinding out five, six yard runs um, and putting them in more manageable situations on third down, but they still really couldn't convert. So there weren't many positives, but those are the ones I saw. Yeah. And I suppose that, the defense was pretty good in the first half. They only let up 10 points. I think Dio Dangbo played a great game as he's been playing all season. Um, but again, you know, the offense managed to string together a couple possessions. They managed to get into the red zone. But I'm, I just don't care if they can't punch it in, if they can't convert it to the scoreboard. Because frankly, you know, 100 yards is not going to do you anything if it doesn't convert to the scoreboard. And, and this is a problem we've seen through the first couple of weeks uh, in this Vanderbilt team that has scored 12 points in week one, two of which were a safety, seven points in week two, seven points in week three. I haven't even looked at the rankings in the conference. That has to be dead last. I can't imagine anyone scored less. And now to get into some things that may not have gone as well, I'd like to start with the one that was infuriating to watch. Uh, as someone watching from a distance, as someone finally allowed back in the press box because I'm no longer in quarantine. I thought the play calling was atrocious, frustrating, and to be honest, illogical. In the first half, like I said, um, Vanderbilt had missed a kick. And because of that, when they made it to the red zone next time, uh, it was fourth and three on the three yard line. Now, you don't want to kick the field goal when your kicker is one for three on the season, has missed a 29 yarder and a 22 yarder. And we'll get to that, but you have to go for it. And if you have to go for it, I don't understand why the play call is to have seals roll out right with his only receiver in the vicinity. Only receiver on that side of the field is a running back on a crossing route in double coverage. That makes no sense. And to be honest, I, of course, I don't know the play call. I don't know if that was the design of the play. Maybe there was supposed to be someone else there. Maybe someone didn't make it over to that side of the field. But giving him one target, I mean, Seals did not want to tuck that ball and run, right? He knew that he was going to get tackled or pushed out of bounds. So he held it for as long as humanly possible, hoping someone would open up, find themselves with a couple feet even of free space. And he couldn't find anything. And he was eventually tackled out of bounds. Um, you know, maybe if he had gotten rid of the ball as soon as he took the snap, 
something would have been different. Maybe he would have found a target. I can't, I can't knock on him for having patience there, though. You wanted to see the play develop, especially in the red zone. And this is a kid who's thrown red zone interceptions. So he was being smart and nothing opened up. That's one play that certainly ticked me off um, as Vanderbilt went into halftime trailing 10-0. And this, this next play call to me, I don't even know how to explain it other than giving up or, or, or trying to convert on a play that wouldn't even work in a video game. On third down, uh, Vanderbilt may have thrown a pass that, or Vanderbilt threw a pass that may have been a complete pass. It sure looked like it from some angles, but the ruling was that Chris Pierce uh, had dropped the ball or that the ball had hit the turf or something like that. They called it incomplete. Vanderbilt's brought up fourth down on their own 30 yard line, trailing by 10 points with 13 minutes left in this, in the third quarter and a full fourth quarter left. That's basically an entire half of football left to play. And with eight yards to go, they call it a double reverse fake punt. I saw that and I just cringed. I was like, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know why they're doing that because they're not out of this game, right? Now Texas A&M is at the 30 yard line, ready to punch it in, ready to score and open the floodgates, which that's exactly what they did because from there on out, the points kept pouring in. But if Vanderbilt had pumped that ball, South Carolina, whose offense did not look incredible until the end of the game, uh, would have been forced to string together an entire field drive to, to score anything. So those two play calls certainly stood out as the worst, but the play calling this past week was not the great play calling we saw in week one, that's for sure. Um, that was a big detriment to me in this game. Moving on, Justin, Bobby, what did you guys see in this game that might have been that you might be able to point to as a sign of weakness or, or a detriment to the Commodores in a 41 to seven loss to South Carolina? I'll piggyback on what you said, Simon. I thought the play calling was questionable, obviously. I, I thought not necessarily the offensive play calling in the middle of the field, but some of the decision-making uh, that was made. I actually disagreed with not trying to kick that field goal on the play that they ran uh, right there on the goal line on that fourth down. I thought you got to give Pearson Cook another shot. I know he hasn't shown Commodore fans much, but I, I believe that you have to play that, uh, play that straight and, and kick that field goal. And I have to believe that play was a busted play. I was really happy to see Ken Seals not try to force something and instead take the sack and set up South Carolina with poor field position. But that play must have been busted. Someone must have ran, run a wrong route because I don't believe for a second that Todd Fitch would call such a terrible play. Um, and again, that double reverse, they, they, they saw a, a fake punt work last week uh, against LSU. And I guess they tried to catch South Carolina off guard with throwing another wrinkle in it. But I agree, it was poorly timed and it set uh, South Carolina up um, with great field position. And that was a huge swing in that game. I think one other thing we've talked about, the, the defensive line looked OK. I thought we saw some good things again from Dio and Andre Mintz uh, and even Davion Davis. Uh, but just the run defense in general has been really brutal overall. I think it's more on the linebackers um, because I think it's been a lot of big chunk yards that have come at the second level. But this is now three weeks in a row where opposing ball carriers are averaging well over eight yards a carry um, in terms of uh, their starting running backs. And that's three games in a row over 100 yards rushing um, and and a score and uh, two, th five rushing scores, excuse me, this week for South Carolina. So I thought the run defense was definitely problematic. And some of it comes back to the tackling, which we've obviously referenced a, a good amount, but Obviously, the guys being out for COVID affect that as well. But I think that was a huge issue for the Commodores on Saturday. Yeah, I, I'd like to know what happened to the offense that we saw in week one. Um, I mean, I feel like the play calling is getting stale now. Um, I feel like it's almost predictable in that when you see Ken Seals leave the pocket right away and roll out right, you know nothing's going to happen. Um, I mean, I think one positive I can take away from that is he's not trying to force something in those situations. And he's willing to throw the ball away. Um, which even you see with professional quarterbacks, sometimes they have a hard time understanding that. Um, but I think that the secondary is something to be concerned about. I think this week you can give them a little bit of a pass and that because Kaufman wasn't playing, Jerkins was also out. Um, but this is something that we've seen consistently from this defense uh, this year and even last year, even though there's a new defensive coordinator now. Um, I just am not inspired by this group right now. Um, I don't 
understand how you can continually miss assignments and and miss you know covering a, a, an a gap or whatever type of you know situation you're in and allow a guy on one play to run 80 yards down the field and then totally just deflate the entire any chance you had at potentially coming back in a game um, and those are killers um, and this group continually allows them to happen and a letter point I want to bring up is the special teams is the kicking is is obviously not great I know it sounds like a broken record we've harped on this a lot but when you can't rely on your kicker to make it a 3-3 game in which you can sort of you know level up the momentum that is a total swing to the other team and for a team like Vanderbilt that relies on those momentum swings and those glimmers of hope to have a chance to you know uh, potentially remain competitive that's a killer um, and you just can't have those mistakes and, and they're it's a combination of beating themselves with missing assignments in those kicking situations and also just missing assignments on run you know run plays or pass plays but it's also the opponents are flat out outplaying them and that's not a good combination yeah, and I want to circle back to a couple of things that Justin said, um, particularly uh, him saying that, you know, maybe Vanderbilt should have gone for the field goal. That's not a terrible idea. I don't say, I don't necessarily disagree um, because I do see what you're saying in that Pearson Cook needed some form of confidence. And it's not any, it doesn't help build confidence when your coach basically gives you a vote of no confidence and says, we're going to go for it. We're not going to let you even try. That said, in weeks past, uh, there's been a little bit of a conversation of, you know, Vanderbilt playing to score and not to win. Uh, there have been times where Vanderbilt had attempted field goals in field positions where, frankly, they may have been able to go for it. And this, like I said, was a winnable game. This is not a great South Carolina team. I didn't necessarily have a problem with going for it. It was more so the fact uh, that they had such a broken up play call. Um, and second thing um, that I wanted to harp on that Justin mentioned was, you know, the, the fake punt or a version of the fake punt working the week prior. Now, I understand that they used a fake punt to their advantage. I have to imagine with the multi-million dollar coaching staffs that they have in the SEC, every single one of them would have watched the film and said, oh, they might try a fake punt against us. So South Carolina was probably looking for it. I'm not sure if it working the week prior is necessarily reason to think they should try again. But all in all, there was not much, uh, not much, uh, not many positives in this game for the Commodores. Um, last thing that to me, uh, I mean, you guys mentioned on the, mentioned this with both the run defense and the secondary because frankly, at times it doesn't look like we have a secondary. Um, but with the chunk yardage, with the long gains. There are times where, like Justin said, the rush defense is poor. The rusher, the running back, the quarterback, whoever it might be, because Colin Hill had a 22-yard touchdown rush. As soon as they break through that paint plane, as soon as they get to the second level, they're gone. It's, it's, it's a, a house call, and that's concerning. We saw back-to-back one-play possessions. South Carolina scored 14 points in 30 seconds with the ball on two plays, an 88-yard house call, and a like 50 something yard uh, also double reverse uh, touchdown, which those are plays you can't be letting up routinely to any team in the league and expect to come out winning a ball game. Like I said, though, um, Vanderbilt is now going to go a long time without playing. So I'm not even going to bother. We're not going to bother outlining Ole Miss because as we've learned in this COVID environment, the team could look miles different than it does now, uh, come October 31st. But guys, on Halloween, three weeks from Vanderbilt's last contest, how big a a challenge do you think it might pose for them to go that long without playing anyone but themselves in intra-squad scrimmages? I've gone back and forth on this all day thinking about would it be a positive thing to have this time off or would it be negative? And everything I keep coming back to is they are not going to have a full team. Derek Mason said it today that they're a shell of themselves right now. And they're in the upper forties in terms of scholarship players at the moment. And I don't see how that's going to change numbers wise significantly in the next two weeks leading up to Ole Miss. Um, I'm sure you'll get some guys back. Some of those guys, especially who didn't play Saturday and we knew uh, were going into quarantine last Thursday or Friday. Um, But other than that, you're going to be missing guys this week and next who are just getting positively tested. Um, and that's not going to be good for chemistry, and especially for a defense that 
already is struggling with chemistry and already struggling to play as a unit, that's going to be a negative in my opinion. Um, I think you'll get some more time for uh, Ken Seals and some of the skill position players to really get comfortable in Todd Fitch's offense. But defensively, I think this is really going to hurt uh, the Commodores moving forward. Yeah, I don't, I don't see how you can see a positive out of this, um, not to make a pun on the situation, but, um, but long breaks for a lot of teams don't help um, unless it's a situation where you have a lot of guys that are banged up and you know, potentially are injuries and they don't, and then allowing them to get some rest and then come back refreshed for the next, for the next games is a good thing. But in this case, it's not, um, I mean, continuity in, you know, this program is, is big. Um, and especially with the D like Justin said, with the defense is already struggling. And this is a team that returned 11 starters from last year. So they had, you know, on defense, so they had you know, time to they played together pretty much all of last year. And then they, you know, are continuing into this year and then still struggling. So, I think not being able to see the field and, um, you know, not being able to play against other opponents is sort of, it doesn't help. Um, and I just think it'll almost be like day one again, and that you'll see some of those pregame jitters and those, uh, you know, people being apprehensive. And then maybe you'll see even a regression a little bit in Ken's play or some of the other players being a little more timid. Um, I, I, I can't think of anything, you know, constructive or positive to say about a long break, and especially in the middle of the season in an all SEC schedule, it's not good. Yeah, I certainly agree. Um, I think even if they come back at full strength with no one in quarantine, which by the way, is very unlikely because at the rate people are contact traced, and I just got an Amber alert, at the rate people are contact traced, uh, they could very well on October 31st return to play with guys still missing. We have to also remember there are some people nursing injuries and who's to say that they'll be available. So I certainly agree that three weeks without play is tough. But honestly, what I think the number one wrinkle in this, the biggest detriment to Vanderbilt being successful moving forward, come October 31st, it will have been 35 days since they've played a road game. Let that sink in. 35 days since they played a road game because they played Texas A&M week one, they hosted LSU, they hosted South Carolina, and they were supposed to travel to Mizzou this week. That's a long time. And you've got a really young team. They're not experienced. They're not experienced playing on the road. And I'd have to imagine, and look, they certainly handled the week one atmosphere at Kyle Field very well against Texas A&M, but I'd have to imagine that all those freshman early year jitters on a road game, which are often amplified, could be even worse because it's basically like playing your first road game again. Um, it's been that long. 35 days in football terms is like half the season. Not actually, but it's a long time. And I think it could really hurt the Commodores, but we won't even bother outlining Ole Miss because that seems like a year from now. Instead, we'll talk about the other Vanderbilt sports team that also lost to South Carolina this weekend, although this one was a close contest. This soccer team is in uncharted territory. It's something Darren Ambrose has really not experienced since he took over the helm of the Vanderbilt soccer program. After beating Kentucky, they've lost three straight games, um, all very close contests. And this one this one had a few decisions, or one decision late in the game, one decision earlier on, that may have honestly decided the game. Vanderbilt's first goal may or may not have crossed the goal line. The refs, or the refs did not review it. Instead, one of them said he saw it cross the pane, and thus Vanderbilt tied the game 1-1 after an early South Carolina goal. Once they go to extra time, South Carolina on the, has possession in their attacking third, and a cross hits off the hip of a Vanderbilt player, or so it seemed, and the South Carolina bench starts screaming bloody murder for a handball. Now, I don't know if it was handball. Um, it sure didn't look like it. It looked like it hit her hip. But after an initial no call, 30 seconds of screaming led to the referee actually calling a late penalty kick. South Carolina converted the penalty kick, and they ended up winning 2-1. I feel like a broken record at this point because we've asked this a few straight episodes. When do we start to worry about this Vanderbilt soccer team? Yeah, and I feel like a broken record myself saying that I'm still not worried. I think you knew this was going to be a tough game with South Carolina. They were coming into it uh, two and one with a five to two margin uh, goals wise. And this is a Commodore team that has a young goalie in net and just hasn't really gotten things going early in the game. Um, and once again, it didn't really happen that way. 
Um, but when you look at the Commodores results, I mean, it's OT against Tennessee. It's double OT against South Carolina. It's one mar one goal in terms of margin, uh, margin of loss in three straight games. That Those are close games that as this team get, continues to gain experience are going to flip the other way at some point. Um, and as we've talked about, everyone makes the SEC tournament. This team's going to have a chance to compete for a championship. Um, and I'm, I'm still confident in the team's leaders. I'm still confident in Darren Ambrose. I will be looking for a little more this week at Florida because I think that this is a winnable game despite being on the road. Uh, the Gators are coming in 1-1-1 one, one, and one, um, off a loss to Texas A&M. So both these teams are going to be hungry for a victory. Uh, but I think this could really prove um, that the Commodores can really trend in the right direction moving forward. Yep, I agree. Um, I think that having a game where it's so where referees had such an impact in the outcome um, can order sort of go one of two ways for your next game. I think it can either be something that sort of sets you back and, you know, you sort of all get up in your own head about it. And then, you know, you know, if oh one thing happens is are the referees going to get involved again and determine the outcome again? Um, or it could be something where they end up having a really good game against Florida um, and then sort of putting that to the side. And that was just one, you know, sort of crazy game. And then moving forward, um, I agree with Justin and that I trust this group. I think they have veteran leadership. I think coach Darren Ambrose is going to have this team in the right prepared and in the right good heading in the right direction um, come, you know, further down this season, this very short season um, and into the SEC tournament. Um, I'm not too concerned. Um, I, like I said, so I think, I think this team is prepared for whatever is thrown at them. Um, it's a little bit of a, problem in the beginning of the season so far we've seen with some close results but the good thing is they have been close results and they can very much turn them around yeah one thing I thought was particularly interesting uh on the I believe it was the Mizzou game uh Vanderbilt traveled to Mizzou they lost the game and Darren Ambrose like most games you know acknowledged the fact that they had more chances acknowledged the fact that they played well you know he actually attributed some of the loss that game to the travel. Um, soccer is not like football. They're not always flown on a chartered flight there the night before or even the day before their game. And I believe that day they flew in or uh, they flew in the morning of, and then later that afternoon played the game. That's tough. I mean, he said they look like they were running on dead legs and I can't blame them because that's sort of the turnaround that you can't even ask a professional athletes in most cases, let alone a college athlete let alone a college athlete that has a workload too. Um, he said for this upcoming game, uh, and you can read about this in our preview story on the Vanderbilt Hustler website, he said that they're actually going a day earlier, hoping that that would change something, hoping they'll have the fresh energy, the fresh legs and be able to compete in this contest. And I sure hope that that would be the case traveling all the way down to Florida because that is a long ways away. But heading into this game against Florida, guys, if you had to give me one quick thing that this team needs to solve in order to succeed moving forward, in order to pick up the slack that they've been, they've been displaying so far, what would it be? It's simple for me, and I've said it before. I said it last week. They've got to score first. I think scoring first will really put a lot less pressure um, on this team as a whole, and I think it can really put some pressure on Florida and really make them play from behind rather than the Commodores constantly trying to force a, a shot in net. So scoring first would be a huge plus this game uh, against Florida. My one thing to focus on, I think, is going to be capitalizing on chances. Uh, Vanderbilt in the first two games, I don't know if this is still true from the last game, but I've been out shooting, out, uh, out shooting their opponents, having more shots on goal. So I think if they can turn some of those chances into goals, um, then we'll be looking at completely different scores and then Vanderbilt could potentially be on the opposite side of some of these score lines and then not have a situation where the referees can decide sort of a game or, you know, you're playing from behind, so you're playing more timid and your defense is more backed up and you can actually get out in front, make runs. And um, I think, so again, I think that, uh, I think capitalizing on chances is going to be the biggest thing. Yeah, I, I agree with both of those points. And, and to point out what Bobby said, you know, they certainly have the opportunities. The opportunities are there. And, and Darren Ambrose is so frequently saying that this team is playing better soccer or on the same level as their opponent. They just can't put the shots away. And like Justin said, even in their one win of the year, they found themselves down 2 nothing at halftime, which in many cases is an insurmountable lead. They managed to climb back, but you can't rely on, on getting out of that hole every single game. 
I'll look for them to score first, like Justin said, and I'll look for them to convert on those opportunities, especially the ones inside the box. I'm hoping that Vanderbilt soccer will be able to come out with a victory, but more, more so, I'm hoping that Vanderbilt soccer will be able to make it through their even shorter season than football without having to miss a game. Let's hope they won't have to postpone anything. I'm not sure what that would look like because I doubt they're moving the, the date of the currently scheduled SEC tournament in, in Alabama. That'll just about do it for this week. And frankly, I'm not sure when next week will be because we don't know how much content we'll have without breaking down a little bit of football film at the beginning of the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. From Simon Gibbs, uh, Justin Hershey, and Bobby Kent, we will see you whenever next time is.